Perfect. Today's agenda, we are going to um, review some of the required written policies uh, when using um, federal funds for reimbursement. Those policies will be the written travel reimbursement policy, the procurement procedures, and the standards of conduct. And over to you, Shelley. Oh, I'm sorry, Shelley is going to be a little late, so I will go ahead and um, tell you what you're looking at here. These, this is a chart that um, have funds available that have yet to be drawn down. You can see that um, these funds are coming up on ex uh, expiration. So I encourage you to go in, make sure that your district is up to date on their invoicing. The next slide is overdue performance reports and um, the due dates have passed long ago for most of these. Uh, ESCA is at 91% complete. This will impact your substantial approval for your FY25 funds. And um, IDA is at 85% complete. Adult education is um, complete, I believe. And the SR FY23 performance report is at 85% complete as well. Okay, so here I have um, given you definitions for policies versus procedures. Policies provide rules and guidance for decision and procedures are detailed step-by-step. -step. Um, to be clear, uh, most of the requirements in 2 CFR 200 are asking for one or both in written form. Maine School Management Association offers templates for these written policies and procedures. Requirements when administering federal funds to support expenses related to travel and procurement. Now I want to um, just draw your attention to these are templates. They are made to be amended to um, meet the requirements for your grant. So let's just keep that in mind. And 200.475 is the CFR regulation for travel, uh, your written travel reimbursement policy. If your district does not have one, then you must follow the um, federal government um, travel reimbursement uh, limits which can be found at gsa.gov. Written travel reimbursement policy can be based on actual costs per diem or a combination of the two. All costs need to be reasonable and necessary as indicated in 2 CFR 200.475B. If your policy is based off actual costs, then itemized receipts for all travel costs which reimbursement is being sought are required. The policy will need to have provisions for travel costs to include, but not limited to lodging, subsistence, gas, parking, et cetera. Policies that use strictly per diem rates should include, should include those rates as well. Um, as you can see, I have on the slide per diem costs, and this is just a um, example of one from a district. So even though their per diem cost, they still only want to um, set limits for breakfast, lunch, dinner, it, or for the entire day. So in that case, you would still need to provide receipts in order for us to test the policy. Um, a per diem, policy that reimburse per the government rate. So say you don't have a policy and you're gonna use that. We use the rates um, at gsa.gov, which is the link here that says per diem travel costs. 
there is a way that you can do a combination in I see up to um, a lot in um, policies. So up to $12 for breakfast, up to $15 for lunch. Those would need itemized receipts. Um, if you have a policy that will reimburse mileage at the current federal rate per mile, that's awesome. It just, it automatically says that we need to um, reimburse at the current federal rate and you it eliminates the need to update the policy every time the current federal rate per mile is updated. The district may establish their per diem rates such as shown, shown on the slide. Some dis districts prefer a combination and use the phrase up to. So, um, I encourage everybody to use the uh, federal per diem rates. It's easier, it's easier on you. You don't have to worry about receipts. Um, I will say that the lodging rates are considerably lower than actual costs at this time. So travel reimbursements, the receipts on the right of the slide are examples of credit card authorization receipts that do not have an itemized list of the purchase and therefore are not eligible for reimbursement. So make sure that in your, if you are asking your staff members to um, provide receipts, that it is an itemized receipt of all the costs associated with the expense. Um, itemized receipts for meals, airfare, lodging, mileage, tolls, parking. That's just some examples of what um, travel costs can uh, include. And travel insurance is not an eligible expense. And that is because that is the cost of doing business. Okay, we're going to move on to procurement standards. When using federal funds to procure a good or service, your organization must comply with all mandatory laws, statutes, and regulations to become good stewards of federal funds. This regulation states that your organization is required to have policies and procedures in place to address challenges that may arise, such as the conflict of interest. These policies ensure the integrity of the procurement process your organization must keep records to document your policies in the history of your procurements. The main DOE monitors for compliance with these regulations and the regulations can be found again at 2 CFR 200.318. Documented procurement policies and procedures. You must maintain written policies and procedures as part of your procurement records. Document procedures that outline how you ensure free and open competition without unfair advantages. For example, if a contractor helps your organization draft a solicitation, that contractor is not eligible to apply for the contract. Methods of procurement. Define the types of procurement by setting the dollar amounts and defining the levels of procurement. So as you can see, I have here informal procurement method state of Maine is um, 10,000 or less. And that, all that means is we can provide um, quotes and get a uh, contract encumbered using uh, the lowest quote. The Uniform Grant Guidance defines levels of procurement in 2 CFR 200.320 as informal procurements, formal procurements, and non-competitive procurements. Informal procurement method means that the agency may accept informal written quotes or bids for goods or services valued between $5,001 and $10,000. Non-federal entities must take steps to ensure that small and minority businesses, women's business enterprises, and labor sur surplus area firms are used whenever possible. 
Several strategies are required, so your organization must find the best ways to include them in their process and provide opportunities. So the procurement process, your organization procurement process needs to be documented. The procurement process begins when you assess your program's needs through the application process. Preparation includes the steps we discussed on the previous slide. Remember, you are required to ensure free and open competition. Procurement priorities, small minority businesses, domestic preference are used whenever possible. Determine whether or not your procurement requires quotes, solicitation, or bids. Before awarding a contract, you must ensure the vendor is not part of any debarment list and is eligible to do business with the government. Excluded parties, parties list appears at SAM.gov. Complete a procurement using the best options for your specific circumstances and award a contract. After issuing a contract, you must have contract oversight to ensure you receive the goods as described or the services are being provided as indicated in the contract. This is also known as monitoring your procurements. This includes monitoring the vendor's performance, ensure the performance is in accordance with the terms and conditions of the contract. Finally, you document each step of the procurement process and maintain detailed records. Written standards of conduct. Um, the major one that we look at in monitor four is to make sure that you have um, a standard of conduct covering conflicts of interest and in governing the actions of its employees engaged in the selection award and administration of contact, contracts. No employee, officer, or agent may participate in the selection, award, or administration of a contract supported by a federal award if he or she has a real or apparent conflict of interest. Such a conflict of interest would arise when the employee, officer, or agent, any member of his or her immediate family, his or her partner, or an organization which employs or is about to employ any of the parties indicated herein, has a financial or other interest in or a tangible personal benefit from a firm considered for a contract. The officers, employees, and agents of the non-federal entity may neither solicit nor accept gratuities, favors, or anything of monetary value from contractors or parties to subcontracts. However, non-federal entities may set standards for situations in which the financial interest is not substantial or the gift is an unsolicited item of nominal value. So I have seen written um, policies where the um, district has set a dollar amount um, that they can accept and it wouldn't be considered a conflict of interest. The standards of contact, conduct must provide for disciplinary action to be applied for violations of such standards by officers, employees, or agents of the non-federal entity. And I have um, put at the bottom of the slide that Maine School Management Association does have a template for this known as policy DJH. So if your district does not have a written policy, you may get go get that template and again, amend it so that it meets the requirements for your SAU. Okay. These are some updates for um, the ESEA federal programs. Super excited. The FY25 ESEA application opens and grants for me on 6-1, which we do realize that is a Saturday. So enjoy your weekend and you can get in there on Monday and get started. The next ESEA office hour will be on June 11th from 9 to 10. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, the application 
Uh, FY25 application deadline for submission is 8124. If you plan on um, asking for pre award costs, you need to make sure that your application is received by 8124. Um, the um, FY22 ESEA funds will expire on 9 30 24. I pulled a report this morning. There are still 52 districts that have $1,000 or more to expense. Please get in there and get those um, invoices in. This holds true for the FY23 Tier 3 school improvement funds. They also will expire, and there's just under half of the grant still available. If you have any questions, please reach out to me. I will be more than happy to assist you. I am leaving today at 1030, um, but I know that my colleagues will take good care of you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Shelley Shassi Jandro. I'm the director of the Office of Federal Emergency Relief Programs. I'm joined by a number of my colleagues, Maisha Asha and Karen Kuziak on the call as well. Just a few updates in regards to emergency relief, also known as ESER funds. Any FY23 performance report that is not submitted currently, we still have a little more than 20 districts who have not submitted the FY23 performance report. And what will result in an incomplete performance report is having your invoice submissions be placed on hold. So if you happen to be in a district that is in this particular situation and you have an invoice in the queue that our invoice team is reviewing, you will get a message indicating that your invoice has been opened due to an incomplete performance report. There will be a note in that invoice and there will also be a note in the performance report of that district. So again, just being sure that we can obtain this information as quickly as possible because we have a report that's due to the US Department of Ed uh, next week and this information is critical to be able to utilize to complete that US Department of Ed report. We had some questions in regards to one of our reservation projects, which is the Teach Maine, the Educator Workforce Project. And we want to be sure that everyone is well aware that that project is open on the GEMS portal side. So if you have an approved application, you should be able to invoice for that educator workforce or also known as the Teach Maine project. Again, we are coming to our final days. We are approaching the 100 day mark of uh, many of our funding sources, but primarily our ARP ESER funding source which supports the Teach Maine program, the Evidence-Based Literacy Grant, the ARP ESER funding, ARP HCY1 and ARP HCY2. So as, as we know, you folks will be busy getting in invoices because in previous slides, you saw how much money is remaining at the table. And we still have in ARP ESER 35% of funds remaining. So we do encourage you to think about invoicing quickly, but also effectively, and helping us to avoid a bottleneck as we get closer to the September date. Um, because again, we review invoices on a first come, first serve, first in, first out kind of process. So if you are submitting an invoice for a number of months ago, or even potentially a year ago, and your number 15th, you will be reviewed number 15th in our queue. In addition, the Portal, the GEMS portal does not allow you to submit another invoice until our team has reviewed that invoice that is submitted. So again, we're just, we're strongly encouraging you folks to think about where you are financially, how you're going to be sure that those funds are utilized and obligated by the period of performance and making sure that you have an effective manner in which to invoice and, and process those funds as quickly as possible. The other item, since we're talking about money, um, we wanted to highlight is the dashboard. So the dashboard that we have on our website provides an outlook of where we are financially every month. So it's uh, holistic on the left-hand side, but it's also granular on the right-hand side. 
So if you have some questions about your district and you may not necessarily have access to GEMS because you're not one of the approved users, you also have the ability to, to view this information in a, in a different manner, which is our dashboard on our website. We will be holding one more office hour next week, which is the first Thursday of the month. So we will be hosting our last office hour in June, and then everyone will receive a small break from many of our teams as you folks enjoy your summer vacation. Hello, I'm Jody Trimmer from the Child Nutrition um, Office. Just a couple updates. Um, the fiscal year 25 sponsor um, annual applications will be open in June for NSP. Um, it should be the second week in June it'll be open, but um, it may be open sooner. Um, we'll, on our Thursday update, we will confirm the date that it will officially be open. Um, upcoming, just a reminder, SFSP, our summer food service program, um, will begin operating June, July, and August, and I have added the MEFs revenue codes for the meal reimbursement below, just to, as a reminder, um, as those are coded differently than the National School Lunch Program. And that is it for me. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Barbara McGowan. I'm the Director of Financial Management for the Office of Special Services and Inclusive Education. And I have Ginger Shaw from my team on with us today. Um, Colleen generally does this, so I'm just going to zip down through her slides and um, certainly ask, answer any questions anybody may have. FY24, five allocations are currently in the office, and we plan to have those all allocated and out to you by the end of next week. So that's great news. Um, you have till July 1st to get that application in for substantial approval in order to get that July 1st start date for your FY25 funds. I also want to reiterate that we have a number of performance reports for FY23 that are delinquent and are currently under invoice suspension. And wanted to really encourage you to get to those as soon as you can, um, because if you re are a recipient of over $250,000, you have to bill us monthly. And we do have to clear those, those invoices out of the queue before you can bill a subsequent invoice. So waiting until after September to start processing those, we're gonna get jammed up and, and we run the risk of not being able to process out all of your invoices before the liquidation period ends. So sooner rather than later, I would actually start looking at June 1st as, as my outside date to kind of clean this stuff up. That is late in the day for me. Um, so your applications will be opening soon. Your FY23 funds do expire. Um, your period of performance is over September 30. You do have until December 30 for liquidation, but what that means for me is I need everything paid out to you by December 30. So December 1st would be a very outside last deadline I would, I would have in my mind to ensure payment of a very last invoice. That being said, if you have to put in four or five, six months worth of invoices, you wanna get started now. Um, Let's see, the Aussie fiscal team is always available to help you with your application process or if you're having issues with your performance report, Colleen is, is right here, not today, but she'll be back tomorrow. And she is just excellent. I mean, she's just so helpful and she's happy to do it and answer any questions anybody has. Um, I think that's it. I think she said uh, we had about 15% of those performance reports due. We still have a lot of money in the FY23 grants that we need to get spent down. Um, and that really is our priority right now, getting your application in for substantial approval and getting those FY23 funds spent down. And, and that's it for me. Oh, would you please repeat IDA application open date and due date? Okay. They, they will be opening by next Friday. 
So at some point in the week, we're, we're aiming for Monday, but we're saying we'll get it there by Friday, your IDA application will open. You'll have your, you'll have your allocations and you'll be able to go into Grants for Me and do, do your 619 and 611 applications. The due date for those is September 30. So you want between July 1st and September 30, but remember to get your um, substantial approval date, you need to get an application in in substantially approvable form. So your budget doesn't necessarily need to be set, but your projects and your, pro and your, your projects need to be approved. And then you can assign the budgets prior to September 30 for final approval. It's always been in the past that the budgets are pretty much set and not very, we don't see very often, we don't see districts submitting for projects without the attached budget. Usually they just come in and get fully approved. But you wanna get them in by July 1st so that you can secure that July 1st date of obligation. Otherwise you can start spending the money as soon as you receive approval. So if you don't get your application in until September 30 at all, September 30 is the first date you can obligate funds. You could not pay a July bill with those funds. That's important note there. You need to get substantial approval on July 1st. And Jody, I think that's it for me, unless there's any other questions. Um, yeah, someone just couldn't... Um... I uh, asked if someone could post that SR dashboard in the link below. They can't, and Shelly's going to take care of that. All right. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. David McDonough from the adult education team. Just a, a couple of quick updates. Uh, we've just concluded our RFP competition for uh, the next round of the American Education and Family Literacy Act. Made awards to nine hubs. Uh, so contracts currently going through the process and will be out for superintendent signature pretty soon. Our other big change for <clears throat> AFLA and the IELCE grant is our shift to grants for me. Uh, so we'll be moving uh, to that as of 1st first, first of July for FY25. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with that system. So it won't be a big uh, learning curve for, for, for many of you. Uh, in some of the slides earlier on, there's, there's a fair amount of funds left in this outflow cycle. Uh, so just encouraging folks, I know a lot of people have been doing budget adjustments, encouraging folks to obviously use that money uh, uh, for this year with a deadline of July 15th for those final invoices for FY24. And that's it for me. Morning, everyone. My name is Melissa Sherwood. I'm the Perkins Grant Manager with the Career and Technical Ed team. Um, biggest update I have for you all is the FY25 Perkins Grant application is open in Grants for Me. Um, I've notified CTE directors about this. Um, we're hoping to do some professional development for directors related to um, allowable uses of funds for Perkins, other topics related to Perkins this summer. So stay tuned for, for that. Um, some upcoming deadlines, uh, final expenditure reports are due um, tomorrow for Perkins. Um, we were a little late in having uh, these due, typically they're due uh, in January. Um, so try to get those in. Um, we're also requesting final expenditure reports uh, for the state grant. So both of the FERs are located in grants for me in the FY23 applications. Um, let's see, the FY25 Perkins grant application is due June 30th. Um, if you have any um, remaining revisions to your local needs assessment, you should get those in before submitting your FY25 application. Um, we also should be opening up the state grant for FY25 soon. Um, so just be on the lookout for that, state directors. Uh, I think that's, that's pretty much it. Just to keep on submitting invoices for FY24 Perkins. Um, Want to spend down those funds before we get started on FY25. 
Um, I also hold office hours every Tuesday at three o'clock over Zoom. So any business managers out there um, who are on the call, feel free to drop in, um, bring any questions related to grants for me, Perkins, anything like that. Thanks, that's it for me. Good morning, everyone. I'm Christian Thor, representing the Office of School and Student Supports. Uh, we have four grants currently right now with upcoming deadlines of June 30th. Most of the contracts will be ending on June 30th, and we ask that you please plan accordingly. If you have any questions, they can be directed to Julie Smythe. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any more <clears throat> questions in the chat. Um, our team office hours are listed here as well. And I think, Shelley, is there anything else? No? No, I, I guess we could open up the floor to see if there's any questions from the audience that hasn't been posted in the chat. Um, I have a question. Can you remind me where to find the recordings as of this and previous meetings? The, these recordings have not yet been posted. They will be posted on the Office of Federal Emergency Relief, uh, excuse me, Federal Relief Programs, um, but they, they are still in the queue to be reviewed and before uploaded. I think if there are no further questions, oh, Jody, there, do you have another one? There is this one that just posted. Is there a way to get a copy of the slides while we wait? And I believe, I, doesn't, aren't they given to, um, yeah, we do do we, that. We share our slides with Joanne Allen from the Maine ASBO Association, so Business Managers Association, and she tends to share them in her uh, Friday updates. But if you have a, a particular, for example, if you have these, these slides that you would like access to, I, I would encourage you to reach out to any one of us listed on the next slide, I believe has all of our contact information. Yeah, and sorry. any one of us can get can get this information for you. Sounds like a wrap. Sounds like a wrap. I'm gonna stop recording, I think. <laughs>